Welcome to the Ian Bowsfield Experience. I'm glad you're here. This series of podcasts are just things that come up in my mind when I'm thinking about playing, when I'm thinking about teaching, and general thoughts about music. There are some things here that I hope you'll find really useful. And don't forget, if you've got any comments or if there's anything you want to discuss further, go to ianbowsfield.com. Hello. Another in the What I Learned From series. Um, Today I'm talking about Maurice Murphy, the great Maurice Murphy. Um, Possibly the most special brass player I ever got to work with up close. Um, My hero in my childhood and someone who I became very close to, um, we had a great relationship. He was, of course, first trumpet in the London Symphony. And the first time I heard him play was like probably all the rest of you. The first time I heard Star Wars. I think I was 10 or 11 years old when the first Star Wars film came out. And that first top B flat that he hits at the beginning of Star Wars was life-changing. And I decided at that moment, aged... 10, 11, 12, I can't remember exactly, that I was going to become the next principal trombone in the London Symphony. And so it turned out to be not that long thereafter. An interesting story is what many people don't realise is the first note of the 1M1, the theme tune to the first ever Star Wars film. Would that be episode 4? I forget the actually in the order of it. It was the first one they ever did was the first note that Maurice Murphy ever played as principal trumpet of the London Symphony Orchestra. Of course, he'd been on trial and the train, you know, and he'd finally decided to take it. He moved down to London and 10 o'clock in the morning at Denham Studios was this relatively unknown um, film composer at that time uh, called John Williams and a totally unknown producer called George Lucas. And so, welcome to the orchestra, our new first trumpet, Morris Murphy. Bang! That was his very first note as a member of the orchestra. Um, so he was my hero when I was a kid. The first time I met him was when I played in and fortunately won the uh, Shell London Symphony Orchestra Music Scholarship. And he was so lovely to me. He was so nice. He was a wonderful guy. Um, And at the same time as I met Willie Lang, William Lang, Bill Lang, um, who was a generation of trumpet players before Morris. He was still in the London Symphony at the time. And then he came to record the Tomlinson Cornet Concerto with Yorkshire Imperial Band when I was there. And uh, I... It sticks out in my mind for two things. One is how he could just play so beautifully time after time. And the other thing was how he could just play beautifully time after time, having had a relatively large amount of beer to drink, which was very strange to me and still is very strange to me today. I don't know how on earth he did it. Um, Okay, enough of the anecdotes. What did I learn from him? When you sat next to Morris, it was a very beautiful sound, but it wasn't big. Sounded really small, but amazingly focused. And I had to really get lean. I had to really go for the centre of the note if I was going to balance with him. And the further away you got from him, the bigger his sound got. The higher he went, the bigger his sound got. Um, Someone who's quite similar to that these days is um, Reinhold Friedrich. Particularly, the the, uh, higher he goes, the bigger he gets. And Morris was very, very much like that. So he never actually sounded like he was making that much noise. But if you've heard the recordings or you ever heard him live, you know he was. So it was the importance of the centre, the kernel of the note, the actual... The purity had to be there, but it had a real core because that was the only thing that went. Anything that you do this this way doesn't count. It just makes you feel good. And that's something that I carried through... My teaching, it's something I've carried through my whole career, was what I learned from him there. Um, 
I also learned, he was very interesting, he was very perceptive. When I first joined the London Symphony, there was a quiet entry that I was a bit scared of. I don't think I was knocking it over, in fact, I didn't usually. But he obviously could tell I wasn't comfortable. He just said, what I've learned is if you're ever frightened of something, lift your bell up, put it over the stand. If it's quiet and high and you're frightened of it, lift your bell up. Don't try and hide it. Confront it. Take it on. And that's something else that stuck, stuck with me. He made a big play of, big deal of apparently not understanding what he did. And in many ways, he's one of those people that you would class as a natural. But I have a question. Shouldn't we all play naturally? He didn't want to know about the Omashu. He didn't want to know about how you did it. Claimed not to understand what he was doing. And I think he may have been right. Maybe he didn't. But the theme, the sound, the message that he had in his head, the melody that, he's had, that he had in his head was so strong that I, on two occasions, saw him play the right note with the wrong valve down. It, my attention was drawn to it because the sound was weird. Now that's a message going into an instrument. Talk about making what you want to happen, happen. Um, and it sounds very simple to say that but my teaching and I think a lot of successful teachers strategy now is very much to focus on what we want to happen so what we're actually trying to do is to teach the natural um, but it was interesting and, and at one time because we had such a good relationship I was practicing a solo piece that's right and um, I said to him, I'm having trouble with this bit. I thought, I'm really going to try. No one has got the inside line on Morris Murphy in any way as a teacher. No, because he said he didn't know anything about it and he didn't want to teach. So I had this bit here. And he said, well, why don't you play it for me? And I played it and it obviously wasn't that great. And he said, have you tried practicing? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, well. So I can't help you then. And he had a saying at the time, which was off the face, in the case. He was not a big believer in practice. But I guess in those days he was playing so much in the orchestra and in sessions that he was staying in reasonable shape anyway. He, in many ways, formed. When, when he died, I was very grateful I have to say at this point to one of his best friends, um, many of you not from the UK will not know his name. His name is, is Richard Evans. He was uh, himself a trumpet player and a brass band conductor. And he sent me an email saying, Ian, you need to go and see your mate. Which meant, well, I don't think he's got long to go. So I'm glad I took the trouble to drive up to um, Barnet to see him. And uh, he was not in great shape, but the eyes, the eyes were still incredible. He was still very much alive inside. And when he passed away, Michael Tilson Thomas wrote an email to me saying how sorry he was, and he, because he knew it would be close. And he, he said that that guy loved you. And he said, whether you like it or not, a lot of him is in you both good and bad. And that ain't no joke, was what he wrote. And I found that a little bit strange, but with a little bit of hindsight now looking at it, I'm not a Maurice Murphy, but he did have a great influence on me. And he was the most polarised of all of the brass players, the great ones that I worked with. He would break your heart one minute with the most incredibly beautiful melody and tear your head off the next, and there wasn't much in between. And that's quite unusual as a brass player. There were the big powerful players, and there were the light delicate players, but he was both, one and the same. And when I look at it, 
I tend to be either, you know, very light ballad type player or the big sort of big hitter type as well. So I guess that was from sitting next to him, I picked that up. He was also um, a big believer in keeping people's feet down on the ground. He was a big believer that we had a job to do and we were all normal, ordinary people. I remember when I made my first solo CD in about 1991, you know, the one with the embarrassing hairstyle on the front. And I proudly, when I got this CD, I proudly presented it to him. I said, Morris, my CD. And he looked at it and he said, oh, that's fantastic. I've been hoping for this. I've been looking for one of these for ages. You see, I've got this table at home and it's a bit rocky and wobbly. I think if I put that underneath one of the legs, it'll just stabilise it. Thanks very much. And it was with that kind of humour that used to keep people's feet on, their ground, on the ground. He also had a way of um, speaking to a wait, uh, uh, in a way to conductors that the rest of us would have got fired for. I don't know how he did it. He was very, very charming. So, I guess that's about it. I still get caught unawares. When people pass away who are close to you, you deal with the mourning process and you get over it. With the case of Morris, because he played on so many film soundtracks, you might be walking around somewhere and all of a sudden you'll hear it and it just really hits me quite emotionally. Um, so he was really, really special and I'm very happy to have got the chance to give you a few of my thoughts and memories and some of the things I did learn from him. Um, I learned more from listening to him and from the way he behaved than, you know, I did from trying to draw pieces of information out of him, but very much sadly missed. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. If there are any issues that you found particularly interesting, don't forget to contact me and always go to uh, ianbowsfield.com for lots more interesting stuff.